Hi, my name is Taylor and I am a survivor of sexual abuse and human trafficking. So I was actually born into human trafficking. I had my mother and my father in my life. However, my mom was a very hard worker growing up and she was never absent because she wanted to be. She was just a very hard worker. She really did not know anything that was going on. And behind the scenes, I was being tortured and it, everything looked great because I was a competitive dancer growing up and I was a track and cross country runner and no one would ever guess that behind closed doors I was being sexually abused and being sold to other men. My biological father was my sex trafficker, my sexual abuser. So the moment that I realized that something was off or something wasn't right, I was actually nine years old and I was in the car with my mom and she was giving me the birds and bees talk, you know, kind of telling me your private areas and that no one should ever touch those private areas. And I just remember my heart sinking to the pit of my stomach and an overwhelming flush of heat racing down my body and just thinking to myself, that's what your husband is doing. That's what my dad is doing to me. And I didn't know how to speak up about it. So I was, I was really terrified. When the abuse and the trafficking got really bad to where he actually got his realtor license in the state of Florida, where I live, and um, he had open houses. And so during those open houses, you know, you would think that people wanting to buy the home would, you know, show up and look through the home to see if they like it and possibly buy the home. It was never like that. You know, he was a realtor and he used those open house opportunities to have a vacant spot to sell me and my body. I felt so silent, so afraid, and so numb. And I honestly, I didn't know how to tell anyone, even if I had the chance to, I really wouldn't have known at that age how to tell anyone. I started acting out in ways, you know, like fighting in school and my grades were slipping. So the first week of my sixth grade year, I was actually Baker acted. And what that means in Florida is you are placed on a 72 hour involuntary hold because I did not know how to deal with the pain of being so silent, being in a grocery store and wanting to scream out the words help me so badly. I do remember my fifth grade year orientation, you know, where you, you go in and your parents are with you. And I just remember going into that year was, I just, I just knew it was going to be hard for me. I just kind of felt really alone and isolated. No one ever really checked up with my parents. I did have teachers that kind of asked me if I was okay, if they saw anything, you know, my behavior changing, they would ask me, is everything okay at home? Or are you doing okay? Or if you need extra time on this assignment, let me know. So yeah, I was very terrified to tell anyone what was going on because like I say a lot, you know, I was forced into silence and just those threats alone, on top of me feeling so numb and dissociated from myself, it was just so hard and I just, I never, honestly, I don't, I never had the courage. I never I never had the strength at that point in my life to speak up. I guess how I coped during this time in my life was I didn't cope in any healthy way. I was constantly getting Baker active and I just felt so depressed and I was being prescribed every single medication in the book. And that actually leads to when I was 14, I was called into my biological father's office. I sat down on his lap and honestly, I really thought that it was just a medication being prescribed by my doctor who I was seeing very regularly at that point. And it turned out to be. So I don't really feel like you ever get out mentally and emotionally. I feel like the damage is there and the damage has been done. And I feel like all you could really do is heal yourself and I don't like the term move on because you really can't move on from something like this. It's going to stay with you forever. I really like I really like using the term moving forward because it's not moving on, but it's moving forward with your life. Like that stuff did happen to me, yes, and that was horrible and very extremely unfortunate because I was a child and I didn't have to be strong and I should I should have never had to play that role, but I feel like moving forward and not letting those times in my life where I was being severely abused and tortured, I feel like I 
don't have to let those times define me. The sexual abuse and the sex trafficking happened until I was about turning 16 years old. After that, the Department of Children and Family Services and Child Protective Services got involved not only once, but twice. I think maybe three times they were involved. I remember the last time that they were involved, they actually came to the home that I was staying at, which was with my father. And my health actually at this point was so bad that I had to do homeschooling. I remember the Department of Children and Family Services walked into the house and immediately my biological father, he grabbed me up and he took me to my room and he stuffed me to the back of the closet. Even though I was in the back of my closet, I could still hear what was going on. The house echoed a lot. And so I just heard her asking him questions like, so what do you and Taylor do for fun? And he would answer, oh, you know, we go to Starbucks and I take her to the movies. And I just remember like thinking, you've never taken me to Starbucks. We've never gone to see a movie together. What are you telling this case manager these lies for? And as soon as he said those things, the case manager stands up, I'm thinking, because I heard her heels. And so I'm assuming that she might have stood up and she said, okay, well, I'm, I'm kind of new and I think, I, I think we can close this case now. And I just remember my heart, like I felt like it stopped in that moment, honestly. So eventually after the Department of Children and Family Services and Child Protective Services stepped in, my mom and I actually came to an agreement that it would be best for me to attend a treatment program, a residential treatment program. I actually turned 18 in that program. So I had to fly all the way back down to Florida when I turned 18 just to get a restraining order. There are parts of my story that I probably will never tell, honestly, because they're so painful and traumatizing and hard for me to share. But he, even, even with those papers, the restraining order, the protection order, he still has violated them. Even to this day, he has violated the order multiple times. And even though I call the cops and even though I make the reports, nothing is ever done about it. And that needs to change. There is no justice in the system that needs to change. Healing is not a linear process. I am going to be healing every single day, probably for the rest of my life. It was actually during quarantine that I downloaded TikTok. I actually started speaking up about my story. I feel very empowered in just having the following in the platform that I do. I'm not a celebrity by any means, but I feel as though I am a huge advocate and I never want anyone to feel alone. And I feel like my personal slogan is pain into power. My name is Taylor and thank you so much for watching and listening to my story of being a sexual abuse and sex trafficking survivor. If you know someone that could be in danger, please encourage them to call 1-888-373-7888. That is the National Human Trafficking Hotline and they have so many resources. And I just wanted to end this by saying you are not alone and you have an army behind you that you probably don't even know you have yet.